Welcome everybody. My name is Mark Wormsley and I'm the founder of the Arts and Culture Network. Um, please do post in the chat where you're joining us from. I know we've had some last minute registrations from far afield, which is fantastic. Um, and if you'd like people to be able to contact you, um, please make sure that your full name is in your video window and that you, your contact details are in the chat, which would be great. Um, we are recording this session. Um, if you prefer not to be seen or mentioned in it publicly, please let us know by email and we can make sure that that's, that's the case. Um, if you're, um, do please put your first name and your surname in the, uh, the video window. You can do that by clicking on the three dots at the top right of your video um, box. So this is the, the first of our speed showcases um, in which up to five of our members get to present for five minutes only using up to five slides, if any. Um, we're feeling our way a bit on, on this, so do please forgive any technical issues we have, but this is the first um, version of this. Um, we've got a, a number of events coming up, which I'd like just to mention. Um, our next random speed networking event um, is at 1 p.m. GMT on Thursday, the 3rd of March. We'll be letting you know about that after this event. Um, at our events, if you haven't been to one of those before, uh, I think Nick's been to all of them. Um, we all get to meet um, nine or more colleagues at random in a series of five minute one-to-ones in under an hour without leaving our desks or having to dress from the waist down if we don't want to. Um, they're all fun, uh, very friendly gang here and they're very fiendishly effective. We've had some really great success stories recently, including more than one hire as a result of our meetings. So. So do please register for the 3rd of March, um, if you can. We have, on the 29th of March, we're doing this at lunchtime for those on the East Coast of the Americas. Um, and we've all got, already got a number of um, members signed up for that one. So do please have a look. Um, and we have a bit of an inner circle now for the Arts and Culture Network. Um, so if you'd like to be uh, to engage with members between these events, then we do that at artsandculturenetwork.com. It's, um, it's just 15 pounds a month and your first month is free and you can cancel at any time, helps us continue to do this. Um, and a, a portion of that revenue goes to the Arts and Culture Network Fund and members can nominate deserving causes and then vote on who we, who we support. Um, so do please take a look at artsandculturenetwork.com if you haven't already done so. So before we start, um, a few housekeeping tips. Um, somebody's just emailed me asking for the Zoom link. So if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Um, excuse me one second. I'm going to reply to that. Um, in fact, I'll do that once we've started our first one. So there we go. So um, please remain on mute unless we're in some sort of Q&A discussion, but keep your camera on if you can. Um, if you've arrived via Eventbrite and Zoom is looking a bit unfamiliar, you can go back to Eventbrite and choose the open in Zoom option on the online meeting page. Um, if at any stage you get disconnected, please just come straight back in and Joe will let you back in from the waiting room. Uh, you might like to select speaker view if you haven't already done so, so that you can focus on our presenters. Um, and there we go. So um, let's get started um, at five past. So we're going to do five minutes and then we'll do however long of Q&A. Um, if, if, if you're prompted to ask questions, please make a note of them so that we can ask. So first up um, is Nick Corston. Nick is the founder of Steam Co. Uh, he's waving and doing a great job around the country, getting children to be more creative. And Nick is also one of the founding subscriber members of the Arts and Culture Network. So all yours, Nick. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have one strap line that Art Connects, and I think what you're doing here is fantastic, the way you connect. I just want to say, actually, this is the first time I've been out of my home. I've got on a tube train. I'm actually in a, a service with an office in Piccadilly, and I can't believe it. But behind me is one of JR's pictures because the T-shirt I'm wearing is inspired by him. But I haven't got time to tell you about that today because I'm on a time clock. So let me just start the clock. And just to say, I'm not doing PowerPoint. I don't want to use PowerPoint today. Um, death by PowerPoint, whatever. I'm actually going to do this by just changing the background in my, in my Zoom course. If I put my thumb over there and press that, 
I can bring up um, I can bring up the first image, which is okay. Is it not going to work? There we go. There we go. So here's my first image. My life was changed by this man, Sir Ken Robinson's TED talk on how schools can kill creativity. I also read half a book called What's the Point of School and went to a festival called Camp Bestival. I thought I want this in my kids' school because I don't want anybody teaching creativity out of my kids. So I've got to thank this man. He actually nominated, nominated me for a, for a TED fellowship on the back of what I'm going to tell you about in a moment. So really, really grateful to him. So basically, I went back to my son's school with my wife and a collaboration of other parents, carers, local businesses, and we ran creativity days, which we came to call Steam Co days. And they really were quite fantastic. It's just changing the background as if I'm living in a PowerPoint. Um, so we did all sorts of things. The children could choose from 20 creative activities that were presented and run by the community, by parents working with teachers and children across the school in different year groups work together. Teachers work with children that they've never worked with before. And here you've got two children from two different years with a dad making paper rockets. And, and rockets are a fantastic activity because everybody can make one. We can fire them over the roof. It's really engaging. But just as inspiring to me is, is making things from cardboard boxes. And this picture is one of my favorites. Um, and this is from 10 years ago, actually. I was on BBC Breakfast launching a thing called the Global Cardboard Challenge. And for my sins, I'm actually now a, um, an ambassador for a fantastic little product that lets you make stuff out of cardboard. This is rough fumbling around. I'm probably not going to find that in a time. Oh, there we go. These little tools that let you make things out of cardboard. But I'll tell you about that on my next talk. So moving swiftly on, I started it 10 years, 11 years ago in my son's primary. Five years ago, I gave up a perfectly good career in the advertising and marketing industry to roll it out as a social enterprise, a non-profit community enterprise called Steamco, um, to take it into schools across the country. Um, easier said than done, when you don't know anybody in education, you say you've got to build a network, you've got to build a profile. So that was phase one of the plan, build a network, build profile and see if people are up for it. And the, the response was phenomenal. Um, I started traveling around the country doing half, half day workshops, doing an assembly, doing the rocket workshop, letting off a dynamite rocket, and then hoping that that would lead to a full day, and it often did. Then COVID struck. Obviously, nobody was allowed out. I certainly wasn't allowed anywhere near a school, and the schools weren't even open. So I was very, very grateful to the, the Arts Council England, a charitable trust called LGFL, and the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, because they all gave us grant funding. And basically, I completely re-engineered what we were doing in schools, that community engagement model. I completely re-engineered it using a green screen. And believe it or not, I actually ran a Glastonbury festival on a cardboard pyramid stage in a school in Somerset while all the children were in their bedrooms at home and their, their homes. And I was in a back bedroom in Paddington because basically using my green screen and using some drone footage I already had of this school in Somerset and using some very clever computer graphics. So a little bit of creativity, some cardboard, some code. We ran a three day Glastonbury festival in their school playground. We've done them on cardboard Coventry cathedrals where the tower takes off. And that was all part of Coventry City of Culture last year. Um, at the moment, believe it or not, I'm touring the UK with a cardboard base camp as if we we're on Mars, inspired by this chap, Elon Musk. Elon Musk, and if you know, has said that he wants to take a million people to Mars in 30 years time. A million people to Mars on a fleet of a thousand starships each of which can take 100 people over 10 years. And I don't know if you saw last week, he actually revealed and showed his starship. He's, he's, he's trialed 20 of them. They work, they go, they land, they take off again. Last week, he showed a system that can catch them. And if Elon Musk wants to take a million people to Mars, I think we all have a responsibility, collective responsibility, to use this to inspire our kids to not necessarily want to go to Mars if they don't want to go to Mars, not necessarily work in the space industry if they don't. But why can't we use a story of a man, Elon Musk, who as a child read every single book in his school library. Why can't we use that story to inspire our kids? So here's a photo actually of me in a school in Camden last week where I launched a dynamite rocket. We also had video graphics of a 150 foot high cardboard starship taking off. And this is all part of a thing which I'm calling the Ignite 22 Festival. Now this, believe it or not, is the scene outside my house in Paddington, um, I have a disco ball hanging up in a tree outside my house most of the year, shining light in the darkness through lockdown. A, couple, a school gave me four projectors just before Christmas. So that's an image projected on the wall across the road from where I live. So I live just to the right. 
That little trailer is what is a Steamco truck that's got everything you need in it to run a creativity festival in a school. And here I am magically in that scene. And over there, if you can see in the background there, are the Mayor of London's fireworks from New Year's Eve and Jones, because I actually ripped them all off. I did a little video as if they're playing in our street. Because what we're doing as part of the Ignite 22 Festival, which is a, a year-long celebration of creativity in our school communities to inspire a million kids to aim higher than high with their creativity. I'm doing a UK tour where I'm going to schools doing our Mission to Mars session, which is an assembly, which is creative workshops and a real dynamite launch to get the whole community buzzing. Because it, to, to quote Darren Henley six years ago when he went to Sunderland, we need to ask ourselves, what if? We need to start a creativity revolution across this country. It takes a whole village to inspire a child. And today I call on you to support the Ignite 22 Festival, maybe by branding an event you're doing, by collaborating with us, coming up with some ideas for some events we can do, or to help us raise the million quid. Because I want to raise a million quids to inspire a million kids. So if you can spare a pound, search hashtag Ignite 22. Looks like if I just dropped off. That's fantastic, Nick. Thank you. And that's the end. Brilliant. Did, did you lose my video? Because I lost you. I got a message saying, did, did you see all that? I hope so. <laughs> what, what was going on behind you? Yeah. I've got a, I've got a video. <laughs> I, it, it says that I lost my signal. You, could, you saw all that, did you? That's good. Yeah, we saw all that. We're all good. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I've yeah, been watching you. some Thank of you your videos. And thanks for the opportunity, Mark. No, it's great. I've been watching some of your videos and they're, they're, they're fantastic. So if anyone uh, has a question for Nick, do please raise either a real or a virtual hand. Um, I guess the, my first question would be, where can we see some of this in action next? Um, and is and are we allowed to sort of just rock up or do they tend to be closed events in, in schools? Well, that's a brilliant question. So back in the day, they were events running in and with school communities, but we used to reach out to local members of the community to, to come and get involved and to help. I call them creative carers, hashtag creative carers, people who care, who care about creativity, who care about children, who care about all our futures. So what I'm looking for as part of our Patreon program, so for um, a pound a month, you can just be part of that for 20, 30 quid a month. You can fund one of these days in a school and subject to the safeguarding requirements of the school, you can come in and both witness it, but also get involved in delivering activities. So we've worked with digital agencies in Shoreditch, for example, that shut for a day and sent all their staff to a school in Tottenham. And, and people in that business have said that they're prepared to use their day's holiday to go and work with schools because they had such a great day. You can't underestimate the value. So this is a project that ultimately, once we get COVID out of the way, once we get the safeguarding stuff back on track, will enable anybody who's had kids, not had kids, not going to have kids, whatever, but who wants to work creatively with a child and to inspire kids to get involved. It's a community engagement framework. Nick, thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions for Nick? Any raised hands anywhere? The idea of our um, these, these events is to just start, start the conversation, okay? Um, I'm a big fan of Blinkist, where you get the seven blinks of a long book in about 15 minutes. It's great. Um, and so, um, oh, Claire's got a question. Hi, Claire. Hello. Um, uh, Nick, we're meeting tomorrow. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, it was nice to have a preview of what um, we're going to talk about. We're meeting tomorrow, tomorrow morning. How We've are got... we? Are you from Chelmsford? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted, I was oh, just really... Fantastic. Yeah, I know, I got a preview. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask a question about um, sustainability, because obviously, you know, a hundred, that whole idea of sending a hundred people to Mars or whatever it is, is how are we also teach, how are you also teaching alongside what you're doing around kind of rockets and science and steam and all those sorts of things? How are you also kind of adding some kind of green credentials to all of that as well? Because I imagine there's lots of people that be con concerned about the amount of energy and power it takes to get people to into space. So how is that part of what you're teaching young people as well in terms of that, the kind of creative output, but also the sustainable way of living on this planet? That's a very good point. And I think the first point I'd make is, is I'd be very concerned if people thought all we were doing was about rockets and Elon Musk fanship and fan worship. I think, I mean, I mean it's, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. And I'm just as interested when I talk to kids, I also talk about Stevenson's rocket, how an illiterate boy from Newcastle 
saved up enough money by the age of 14 to learn to read and ended up becoming the boss of the, the, the coal mine where he worked and ended up inventing the passenger carrying steam railway. Um, I, I don't make any excuses for the environmental, in, environmental impact of rockets. Elon Musk, to be honest, though, has done an awful lot for the environment. He's, he runs the he, he launched America's biggest solar panel company. He's pioneered electric cars in the face of adversity um, and is keen to, well, he feels, I mean, his rationale for what he does is to perpetuate the human race and give us a chance in case there is a, a fatal incident on Earth. Um, a, a rocket, 90% of the fuel used is oxygen. It's not just petrol, but, uh, you know, it, there are environmental issues. I have, I, I have no truck with pure space tourism for the sake of space tourism, personally. Um, and it's very dodgy territory. Unbelieve it or not, I had a workshop today developing workshops and activities for children around, uh, around plastic and the environmental impact of that and how we can drive behaviour change and awareness in young people around plastics. Um, it's a very binary world and you get involved in something like paper rockets to inspire kids to be creative and get their dads in and then suddenly you're lumped in with Elon Musk and the environmental impact. It's very dangerous and I, I, have, I, I don't have the answers, but you're absolutely right that we have to educate but more to the point, get children to think critically and not shy away from these difficult conversations, you know, and the whole philanthropy is another conversation itself as well, isn't it? So, yeah, it's, I'm glad you raised that, Claire. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. And thanks, Claire. Kat, I noticed you've got, got a question. Is it a quick one? Yes, yes, super quick. Um, OK, I actually have two questions. The first question is um, you mentioned you watched a TED talk and read half a book. Why half the book? The second question is. Um, why is the focus on Elon Musk going off into space and not on saving this planet that we are all currently on? Genuine question, no shade, no, no. way. I am just that's, genuinely interested. That's totally fine. Um, the first point, the first question was why half a book? Because I don't, I'm, I've had enough TED Talks. I've read, I've, I don't care for anybody writing any more books. I want to get on and do stuff. So I just put the book down and cracked on and did. So I'm a doer, you know, so, and I started Steam Co. And I just haven't got time to read and watch TED Talks. And uh, I'm, I'm, I know what I want to do and I'm doing it. The second point is why the focus on Elon Musk? I do not want anybody to take away a complete focus on Elon Musk beyond the fact that here is an inspiring story of creativity, of, of the combination of knowledge by reading all those books, the combination of skills to apply those. He's a creative, he's an entrepreneur, he's driven. The whole thing is not structured around Elon Musk, and, and I'm sorry if that's what you take away. But I would say that I have had a terrible time raising funds, and one of the most generous funding aspects of what we've had was, was a guy who actually went to space with Elon Musk last year. He funded two tours for me. And I'm sorry, but I'm on a mission here to, to, to launch a creativity revolution, to bring creativity back into our schools. And yes, I will be... Nick, can you? Um, lost him. Yeah, we lost him. Not he is in space now. He's in space. <laughs> I love that. He's gone up in one of his rockets. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Kat. Um, I'm conscious of time, so let's get a let's get a move on. Our next speaker is um, is Zaria, Zaria Warden. Zaria is in Mumbai and is a professional musician and manager. We had a one-to-one -one last week, and it's fascinating what he's trying to do um, in, in India, in Mumbai specifically, um, working hard to, to shift the perception of the value of arts and culture as a profession in India. I will be keeping you to five minutes, um, Zaria, so please forgive me if you see me waving frantically in five minutes. Um, but please, over to you, over to you. No problem. No problem. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, as Mark said, I'm Zareer. I'm based in Mumbai, India. Um, I'm a musician, have been for most of my life, uh, primarily because um, academics was something that never really interested me. So I always tried to find, um, find some kind of outlet. And this was it. Um, music plays a very big part in my life. I'm a performing artist. I'm currently a part of um, a band in, in, in India that, uh, uh, that plays at, at a lot of the biggest weddings, parties, events, social events, corporate events all over the country and parts of the Middle East. Um, in addition to that, just recently, 
Um, I have been working with a few younger kids, uh, aged between 13 and say 19 or 20, who are looking to take on music as a potential career moving forward. Um, now, the reason I say that and, and kind of hype it up a little bit is because um, if, if, if y'all aren't aware, for a very long time, um, the arts in India has never been considered a viable career choice. Um, Indian families, Indian parents are always pushing their children into becoming a doctor, becoming a lawyer, becoming an engineer, you know, one of those um, um, more orthodox and let's say stable uh, career choices moving forward. Um, however, thankfully, I have always had the support of my closest people around. Um, and now things are starting to change a little bit in India, which I think is extremely, extremely important. And I think needs to be encouraged more than anything else. Um, because the biggest task and the biggest challenge in India has always been kids trying to convince their parents that taking on any form of art, be it being a dancer, theater, a musician, whatever it is, any form of arts can be a sustainable choice if, if and a big if, you're ready to put in the time, put in the work and really hustle. Um, now that perception is slowly starting to change. Families are starting to encourage their kids to do it. Um, so that is one side of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to work with younger kids today to give them that encouragement to go out and try and find ways to make this a career to explore it, to get their hands dirty, see that it's not all about what they see on TV. It's not what they see on stage when they go and watch a Justin Bieber or a Taylor Swift performing. There is, There are hours and hours and days and weeks and months and years of hard work that go into even, even getting halfway there. Um, that is something that I'm working very, very closely on. And um, hand in hand, uh, something that I'm trying to trying to almost revamp, which is a, a, a major project and fairly over ambitious, but it's something worth um, worth exploring, is trying to change the the entire scope of the arts culture here in India. Um, now, just to put things into perspective for everyone, India is a country of over 1.2 billion people. Right, that's a large, large, large population. Um, the talent is immense um, because there are the country is so far and so wide um, that the talent does not just have to be in a couple of languages. It spans multiple languages. It spans multiple fields. The problem is there is no real support and no real infrastructure for young artists looking to pursue this and take things forward. That's why very often, unfortunately, you see that most younger, younger people today, by the age of 20, 21, 22, 23, they have no option but to leave their, 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 their talent and their, their art space and go and get a regular nine to five job. Um, and that to me is just considering I'm in this space, is just something that really, really bothers me. It bothers me because in this country, we have the money, we have the venues and the space, and we have more than enough talent. And the fact that not so many people from India are actually breaking out onto that global stage is something that bothers me a lot. So one of the projects that I'm currently working on is how to completely try and revamp and renew the arts culture in India by raising awareness. You know, why can't what happens at the West End in London, why can't that happen in India here? There is no clear answer to why it cannot happen in India because it can happen given the right support and the right infrastructure available to these artists and to this talent. Um, that is a massive project that I've just started working on last month, which will probably take a while to take off even if it does. Um, but yeah, this is basically in a nutshell what I'm doing, the way I'm trying to kind of change the perspective of how people view things. Again, just to just to just to give you all an idea, when 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 I go abroad, say if, 
if if I'm in the UK, the first thing I want to do is I want to book myself into a concert. I want to book myself some musicals that I can watch. The first thing I do is that, right? Um, not because it's me getting ready and going for a show and coming back home because it's an entire evening or afternoon and evening of experience. You meet new people, you network with new people, you socialize, you have a drink, you have a meal, you watch a phenomenal show, you talk about it for the next few days, and then you go for another. That is something that I'm, that that culture and that vibe is something that I'm trying very hard to to put into play here. Great. And okay. um, Daria, thank you. I'm Sorry good. Thank your, you. Sorry to be your early alarm. Call. No worries. Thank you for that. Um, we had a great one-to-one -one last week about this, and we came up with a concept called the Arts Club um, together, which is idea. Uh, you pay a certain amount per year, and you get sent tickets to arts and culture events, but you don't get to choose what it is. Um, that sounds like fun. I, I mean, I always I, I went for years, not, assuming I didn't like contemporary dance, and I went to see some and absolutely adored it. It was fantastic. So we've we've got a few little ideas going on for that, and I've also got some introductions for you with the British Council, who I know would be um, really interested. That'd in be amazing. In what you're That'd doing. be amazing. So, so those are my two comments, stroke questions. Does anyone have any questions for Zaria? No question, just to say amazing project and good luck and your enthusiasm will take it forward for sure. Thank you, I appreciate that. I greatly appreciate that, thank you. Thanks Gabs, yeah, virtual round of applause, there we go. Thank you, I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks very much Zaria and we'll stay in touch with those ideas. Um, thank you. And thank you also for being one of the members of our, our community, um, which is great um, as well. So I'm now going to introduce Shauna. Shauna, did you get, did we solve the technical issues? I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work, to be honest, um, okay. which is a, a total shame because I've been trying while well, you guys have been uh, presenting these really inspiring stories. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of give a little. Uh, yeah, let me just intro, let me do my little intro because, and explain the situation that Shauna is um, a knife. This is a new new to me, and I'm fascinated. And you're going to have to give us some links to follow if we can't see anything <laughs> during your five minutes. But um, Shauna is a, a graphic cartographer, right? Which was a, which was a new one to me. So um, Shauna designs maps to improve the visual understanding of businesses, organisations, and places. Um, I've seen some of the, the the images. If you go and have a look on her LinkedIn page now, Shauna Chapman. Um, and yellow, what is it? Yellow what? Sorry, Shauna? It's uh, yellow fields. I might try and put it in the comments. Yeah, I do. Um, so our challenge now is is to is bring to life things that we really do need to see. Um, but what we could do is if, if you've got another window open or a browser open, what URL could everyone go to to see examples of the output of your work? Um, if I can um, go on to the website, we can probably sort of improvise a little bit with that. Have you been able to share or not? No, yeah, it's just not working. I, I don't right. know whether so it's we'll, like a, Let's ask like her, a, give us a URL in the chat and we'll go and have a quick look. Yeah. Because I think it would be a creative challenge indeed to describe <laughs> graphic cartography in words <laughs> yeah it's i can't even where's the chat here's the chat here we go so if you pop a link in there we can all go and have a look which would be great or we can certainly follow up after yeah because while i'm sort of um how does it work go on give us give us it oh. in a nutshell while you're doing the link in in the in the chat you will find uh the website that you can go in and have a look um, but this is sort of explain what a cartographer does. So I work for a studio that I founded with my partner about um, 18, 19 years ago. And cartography is, is about making maps, understanding maps, using maps for all sorts of reasons. So these days you probably think, oh, well, we have Google or, um, you know, I've got my phone to do everything. But what happens if you maybe are, um, I don't know, like a, an opera house or something like that, and you want to have um, uh, some sort of festival on your grounds and you want to sort of show people how they can um, have the stage, how they can enter, where they can park, 
um, how you can convey that kind of information when you're doing a presentation. So if you can imagine like a, you know, something like, um, I don't know, Covent Garden Opera House or something like that. It's, it's downtown Covent Garden, super restricted for, you know, lorries coming and dropping off equipment and stuff like that. So you can also have maps that show people who are driving lorries, how they're going to come in from Birmingham, Wales, Scotland, whatever, and how they're going to come and drop off equipment to do a show at your, at your venue. And now kind of imagine if you're going to um, run a, a football stadium, you got people coming in from airports, uh, rail stations, tube stations, bus stops, uh, pedestrians coming on bikes and scooters, uh, you know, people living locally. And raise your hand if you've ever kind of arrived somewhere new to go to an event or you're a tourist somewhere and you've just been kind of lost. Yeah, so it's kind of what we call wayfinding is kind of what Yellowfields uh, specializes in. And that is finding your way. And we can get commissioned by um, like an institution such as a, like a, a facility, like an opera house, uh, a city. So, so the city of London, San Francisco, Bologna in Italy, uh, Moscow, uh, places in South Africa, game farms, rewilding sites. It's about sort of when you're rocking up to uh, the, the location, you're kind of Google Maps has driven you there or you've arrived on your train because you've gone, to, you've done enough research to get that far. But what you want to do is actually get to the destination and, and enjoy it properly. Now, if you have a city that's properly legible, then you can really, you, you notice that cities will, um, I don't know if anybody's been to Spitalfields in London. And what you'll notice on a Saturday and a Sunday is that people will leave a certain tube station and they will, without even um, looking at their phone or anything like that, they go and maneuver around the neighborhood and find all these fantastic things, mainly because they're following other people who also know where they want to go. And when you have a, a city that is, doesn't have any sort of proper plan of how they're going to move tourists around, then people just kind of, they get confused, they get frustrated, um, they don't really sort of move around that much. So the businesses around the tube station, the, the uh, airport or this, that, the other thing, almost kind of, it just stays stagnant. It doesn't grow. You don't get people sort of marching around to the side streets to the cool cafe or the pop-up uh, event or the awesome graffiti or something like that. So what wayfinding can do is help um, people um, when they come out of a station, they'll often see like um, a totem, like a, like a, a structure that's just there where you can kind of go like you are here. It's a little bit like that, but also you'll have signs that say opera house, um, uh, you know, a certain sort of uh, flower market, or this is this way to the event, the, you know, the, the football game or the playground or the, um, the, art, the sort of um, the bio quarter or anything. Um, and so when you have totems, they can sometimes get forgotten if they're successful. Because what happens is people kind of, they already kind of, the, the, most people when they come out of a, a station or a, a public uh, transport, they'll already know the neighborhood because they, they enjoy it so much that they go often. And then they'll just try and, what will happen with, with the newcomer is they'll follow in a way if they can't find the totems. So what I do in, 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 with Yellowfields is we kind of move around and produce maps for all kinds of reasons for venues, rewilding sites, um, which is a big thing because of uh, COP26. Um, lots of, uh, when they have um, business improvement districts, so like a town or a, a city in the United, United Kingdom that's maybe sort of down, down on their luck because of all kinds of problems, like maybe a big employer has left town. They have, um, the government gives grants of sometimes up to like a million pounds for businesses to improve what they're doing in their in their little town to sort of bring in more 
new, like fresh blood and just revigorate. And so often cartography or a map will kind of put that um, for a newcomer that they're trying to attract. But they, it, it explains it like this is where things are so that you don't, so that people that don't, they arrive, they don't miss out on anything. Because as I mean, I think three quarters of you easily, when I said, have you ever arrived somewhere and been a little bit lost? And it's very stressful, it's boring. You feel like you wasted your time. But if you have an X marks a spot or a, a way to have a, um, to get to your destination or to, to sort of explore, or like it's almost like little hints about where to explore is, is, is what a map does. And that's what we do. Um, here at our, our cartography base here. We have about um, myself and, a, and an associate as well as um, working with about four or five other creative people, including artists and um, people that um, are ecologists and all sorts of things, which is right. kind of interesting to be, rather than just in, in, in front of a computer, you're kind of talking to people. Donna, that was fascinating. I love a map. I really love it. Um, and it's like Sim City, but for real, you know, um, in, in some ways, yeah. which is I great. mean, which is funny because uh, we we did have a commission uh, to do a um, a zombie map for a video game, and I believe it was uh, made in Los Angeles or based on Los Angeles. Whether or not the thing actually got made, I have no idea. But we certainly did the. Um, the sort of fantasy city and and things like that. Yeah. But Nick, um, Nick raises a question in the um, in the chat. Um, the will geo sensitive apps and augmented reality replace physical maps? Um, and I imagine most of your maps um, are on screens anyway. But is there is there likely to be some technology that's going to make the map um, less relevant I, I, I mean I'm, more and more I think we're probably going to go down that line but I think what what seems to be what you know commissioning people that are paying us to do the map is they're trying to sort of invent new ways for getting people outside mm -hmm. and away from the screen you yeah. know what I mean like yeah um, I can, I whether see. it's uh, moving around a, a town, moving around a park, route, moving around like a region, like, you know, when you sort of think of Route 66 in the States, right? But you have lots of other routes that are being invented in the United Kingdom to get people on, you know, road trips um, in remote Wales or remote Scotland or up in the highlands and places you know, on the islands and island highlands. Um, and so I think you know, virtual reality, I think it would be an expensive way to go about it, I think, um, when you all, you all you really need to do is just sort of get somebody there. And then so, while they're there, they get educated and off they go and have I, I can, I think that's, I think it's fascinating. I, I, I imagine this will be of relevance to Claire for hot spots of cultural um, events in Chelmsford, because I know you're, you're, you're working on that. Um, Alex, I imagine Love to Visit would probably be quite interested in this because Love to Visit is um, uh, a very exciting new destination platform um, with hundreds of um, destinations signed up. Well, Alex is our, our success story. He joined us at our November event and was hired a, a few days later, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, Alex, do you think that would be of interest for Love to Visit? Yeah, I was actually uh, listening and I was just thinking about all the possible like implications um, because we we do just use a traditional like site mapping for our application and the whole platform. But um, like this kind of really, in a sense, UI based mapping, um, UX based mapping is really interesting. So I was actually thinking of bringing it up at some point. So you got ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds that sounds great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Shauna? We're doing okay for time, I think. This is um, this is a great um, initiative. I could really have done with it last year when we visited a venue in deepest, darkest Suffolk, an outdoor amphitheater. And we were trying to find our way to the back of the stage and got stuck in, in deep mud. And uh, if they had had one of these maps at the venue, um, 
it would have been ideal. And of course, from, from an audience point of view, with unusual venues, it's going to help them sell tickets to their events. Yeah, exactly. And and I think um, what maps can do as well is when you have, like, say, the Arsenal football ground, it was sort of um, rejuvenated about, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And what they were doing is um, they they did the commission map to be made. And then what they were doing is they tend took the map that that people were going to use as pedestrians and then the advertisers got in, it, a hold of it and then they discovered out how they were going to, um, where were they going to put the billboards up and, you know, things like uh, flags or, you know, where they might have a little pop-up uh, advertising or somebody handing out leaflets or, or where um, police can put their security. So it's kind of like one map, you know, kind of can be recycled or, or interpreted in so many different ways. So it's, uh, they are, they are, they do have their sort of uh, uses, that's for sure. Yeah, location of car park. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mike, you cut out there a bit. Oh, yeah, uh, location of car parks at venues is important as well for some outdoor venues. Yeah, and then when you're trying to sort of tell your guy, like say if you're running a venue like that and you want to sort of, um, you've got a new staff member, to, you know, can you go around and empty the bins with, uh, you know, your friend Jack or whatever, you can actually go and print off one of these maps or, or point out like this is where I want you to go or, um, or you can go and set up this sort of catering tent there or there'll be a great big huge uh, place to sort of plug in your, um, amp, your amps and your stuff for you know, doing a rock concert, um, you, you flick the switch there. You know, it's it's just to convey information. That's what cartography is really. X marks the spot is is kind of like what the pirates did, and it makes sense, isn't it? Yeah, I'm a, we're all for pirates in the arts and culture. <laughs> Shauna, um, thank you so much. That was fascinating. I'd be amazed if you don't get follow up from this today um, with people who might want to um, understand more or, or refer you to. To colleagues. Um, before we go to um, Mikey, I can never, uh, Mikey, Mike, Mikey, oh it's Mikey, there he is, he is there he is. Um, I just thought we'd do a quick round of, hello my name is Mark Wormsley at the Arts and Culture Network, I'm in Hockley in Essex, um, and go all the way round, um, just so that we've, we've just had a hello from everybody. So if you're lurking with your video off and you are dressed from the waist up, do please um, come back on and we'll go round. It'll be random in the order that I see people. Forgive me if I don't go um, go to our, our presenters because uh, we've met you already. So um, first up, uh, Claire, you're, you're at the top of my list. Claire is one of the advisory board members for the Arts and Culture, which is fantastic and I'm very grateful. So do you want to just say a very brief hello? Hello, I'm Claire and I'm based in Essex. I work across the whole country though. I'm an arts and culture consultant working on two projects, one in Essex in Chelmsford and the other one in Southampton. Great, thank you very much. Um, Gabs. Paul from sunny Dorset in UK. I'm Gabs, very good friend of Mark's and uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, what I do is business development consultancy, but the easiest way to explain it is professional matchmaking. So I like to help with connections all over the world. Thank you. And um, Gabs is one of the most connected people I know. It's excellent. Um, Madam Zucchini, love that. Hi there. Hello, um, Natalie also, but uh, yes, so I use vegetables to entertain and engage. I've gone a bit Shakespearean today. Here's King Celeriac. Um, Love that. So I, I create puppet shows and entertain outdoors, indoors and do workshops. And I'm based in Sheffield. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick will be very disappointed to have missed the um, King Celeriac, um, but I'll send him the recording. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, hello Mike, Opera Anywhere. Hi there, Mike Woodward, Opera Anywhere. We're a touring opera company to across the UK. Um, we're also looking at setting up a festival in our home village of Sunningwell in Oxfordshire for the Jubilee week. Um, and uh, we don't always get stuck in mud. The house behind me is a rather lovely venue. It's not mine, but it's one that we would perform at, as well as all sorts of other weird and wonderful places across the UK. Brilliant. Well, I'm born on wheels. There we go. <laughs> um, Kat, hello Kat. 
Hello, I'm Kat. I'm from Perth in Scotland. I work for Perth Concert Hall and Theatre. That is the cold Perth, not the hot Perth. And, and I'm delighted to see all of your faces, particularly King Solariac. He is the light of my life. <laughs> yeah, make sure you got a picture of King Solariac, won't you? That's, I love that. Alex, um, quick hello. Hi, my name is Alex. I work as an arts and culture journalist for Love to Visit, but I also am a creative and language tutor. So I do lots of different things, photography, content creation, etc. Great, thank you. Tamsin, hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tamsin and I mentor musicians um, to really use their creative spark to help progress their careers, take those next steps and try to love those business skills. Um, I'm based in the comfort of my home in Somerset, but happy to work with musicians anywhere. And um, I, I do send my apologies. I actually need to run because I'm running a session at two o'clock. So it's been lovely to be here today. Thank you. Thanks for coming and thanks for joining us recently, Tamsin. That's great. Hello again, Keith. Hello there, yeah, sorry, but I couldn't find the link, but so I arrived late, apologies for that. So my name's Keith Jeffrey. I'm um, I'm a coach. I help cultural professionals become uh, more confident leaders and managers. I work with organisations and help them develop, um, and help individuals develop their professional purpose so that they can achieve the impact they, they desire. And I'm based in Derby. Great. Thank you very much, Keith. Hi, it's Amina. Hi, um, I'm Jimena Varela. I am uh, from Uruguay, but based um, in Washington, DC. I direct the arts management program at American University and I lead the Association of Arts Administration Educators. Right now, my research is on the York Mystery Plays as the origin of um, Western theater management and on uh, the learning ecologies of current artistic theater directors in the US. And thank you for uh, this amazing session. And thank you so much for coming along at such short notice. I only met, we only connected this morning on LinkedIn. That's great. Thank you. Hi again, Ralph. Would you like to say hello briefly? Yes, I would like to say hello to all of you. I'm still uh, playing the violin in the first violin section in the Munich Radio Orchestra uh, until 24 when I go to uh, retirement. But I built um, um, an agency, you can say, to uh, endorse and to um, support cultural exchange, mainly between uh, Australia and Germany, because we have good guys here and there, but in between uh, there's not a lot uh, what goes on, and uh, we try to, um, to uh, how would you say that, to start a first festival called Australia N uh, Week uh, from 1st to uh, 9th October uh, 22 now, in Munich, uh, in parallel um, and uh, and um, similar to the Brisbane um, German Week, uh, with uh, to to showcase Australian art and culture, there will be uh, Will Barton, the famous didgeridoo solist, uh, giving a concert. We are already booked with him, and we would like any kind of support from members from Munich or all over the world to help us. Uh, give birth to this new festival. That Thank you. Be... Thank you, Ralph. Um, we should chat more about how we can help with that because I know we've already discussed perhaps yeah. arranging some of these events at that, but that's that's great. Thank you very much. And, uh, Hi, Patricia. Thanks for your uh, support. Thank you, Ralph. Hello, Patricia. Hi, I'm Patricia. I'm a PhD student in theater studies, also based in Munich, Germany, like Ralph. And um, I also work in arts and culture consulting here in Munich. Great, thank you very much. I can see, I'm, I do apologize, but it's G Dallum on your, on your, on your video. Hello, G. <laughs> oh, sorry, I did put it in the, in the chat. I'm Greta oh. uh, and I, I'm just here. It's kind of uh, reconnecting with the creative, sort of creative um, community and uh, looking at what's out there. So uh, I just came across your group on LinkedIn yesterday, so I'm just kind of observing. But I teach uh, HD photography at Bedford College. Right. And, and so I'm just looking at new ways of using photography in a sort of cultural context. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you for coming again at such short yeah. practice. Yeah. Um, Augustus, I, I looked at some of your artwork this morning. Loved it. How are you? 
Hello, how are you? Very um, good. Okay, Max, um, glad being in this forum. Uh, my name is Augustus Mweke. I'm a painter and uh, the convener of a circle of uh, independent artists. Circle of Independent Artists is a group of uh, artists from UK, US, and uh, Nigeria. We recently uh, had uh, our first exhibition in Nigeria and the next one coming up in London here. Um, I'm a painter. Great. Please, go and have a, please find Augustus on LinkedIn and follow the links through because it, it's great stuff. I loved it. Thank you very much, Augustus. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, um, Mickey, I'll come to you. We're going to come to you shortly, but there are three people. I'm not sure if you're still with us, Kira, Lindsay, and Jindar. Kira, are you with us? That's very, very lurky observing, isn't it? But um, Lindsay, can you hear me? Would you like to say hello? Oh, Kira said, Yes, sorry, no mic or camera, crikey. Um, I imagine, uh, are you still here? That's great. Jindar, can you hear me? No, okay, well, let's move on. Um, I think most people have put some contact details in. So, Mickey, are you there? Would you like to jump on? I'm really excited about this because um, I've been listening to uh, sort of news items about NFTs and um, non-fungible tokens. Um, so, Please raise a hand if you know what an NFT is. Okay, about sort of most people are doing this, right? <laughs> so, Mickey, five minutes, please. Can you give us the NFT primer and what it means for us in the arts and culture sector? Yeah, um, just quickly. I don't know how much time I have for questions either because we've got to jump on an investment meeting in seven minutes. But hello, everyone. Great to meet you. Um, I'll talk through. Can I share the screen? Yeah, by all means. We'll see if this can happen and works. Um, but I'll try and uh -oh, it's grant systems or something. Um, oh, I've got to open systems or something. Um, this might be too difficult. So I might I may as well just speak through in case this yeah, concept. I do. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'll just dive in. So we set up an NFT gallery last year um it's dow led so I'll, I'll talk you through those first things i suppose uh an nft is kind of like a digital receipt um when you go to the shop you get a receipt for your purchase and if you go to the bank or amazon or facebook you will get a centralized receipt um so blockchain people are essentially advocating for decentralized receipts there's a ledger's different variations, some of them not ecological, some of them quite ecological. Um, and we're essentially vying for people to share data and arbitrage um, assets across this network rather than a centralized closed network that builds in inefficiencies uh, in the environment, in the capital industry. A lot of the, the problems in the past hundred years could probably in an economic business lens be reduced to closed walled garden thinking and like um poor resource management essentially so really the the focus of of these uh not the money making people of blockchain they're in there too but um the core innovation gang of blockchain nfts metaverse people are really trying to create a space where we can share our data in a peer-to-peer self-sovereign way and have um, the empowerment for the creator rather than these networks like Facebook, um, Amazon, et cetera. So we tried our model. We were the third in the world to set up at the time. So we took a nice building in Hackney, renovated it um, with some augmented screens, headsets, AR capacities. Um, so it's an NFT digital gallery that focuses on digital art, digital fashion and metaverse architecture um but then we run it as a collective which is the DAO so a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization which is a group when you enter the blockchain or you wish to trade NFTs or cryptocurrencies you you have an account 
um, which is your wallet. And then a DAO is essentially a group of accounts or wallets that manage um, the activities. In this case, we're an arts organization. So we call ourselves the decentralized arts organization instead of autonomous organization. Um, so essentially we use collective management um, procedures, but we try and do this on the blockchain with transparency, voting. I'm supposed to be the founder, um, but there's, there's about 50 of us in the direct team and everyone has insight over all departments. So every decision we put up on the board and we all have a vote and the organization decides together. So I, as the founder, can never um, say over press any other decision from the organization um which is why we're not a fixed gallery we're yeah a flowing entity so hopefully that wasn't too complex um if anyone's got any questions well, that was that was great that's very pirate it's a bit like us as well i love the i, I love the idea um i've i've heard that this technology described and mickey if you've got to go then go but um it's kind of it's like a trustless you know, environment so if you buy a book from Amazon, you send the money to Amazon. At that point, they have both the book and the money, right? Um, the When they send you the book back, you have the book and they have the money, so that's the deal done. But somebody explained the whole process of, of, of that kind of trustless blockchain-based transaction as being, imagine you've got two shoe boxes with doors at both ends. Um, I want the book, so I'm going to put my money in the box on the left and lock the door. At that point, the other end of the box is not open. So Amazon can't have my money yet. They put the book in the other box and lock their door. When both things are in, all the doors open, right? But only then. So you don't, it's kind of trustless platform. It's fascinating. And, and NF, I've had a look at some of them. So from a layman's, uh, you're the expert, Mickey, but from a layman's point of view, it's the first time that someone can, uh, can prove that they own the original of a digital file. Right. So they and I, I read that Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, um, created he, he has the first HTML file ever. Right. And he sold he he made that available as an NFT. It sold for millions and millions. The first mm. the first page of the web. Um, and you remember somebody somebody bit my finger, that video that went viral um, with the twins. Um, the, the owner whoever took that was able to prove that they were the original owner and they've made a fortune out of that since so it's it's really quite it's fascinating where it's all going um i'm conscious of time mickey thank you so much um i know you've got an invest investment meeting at two and i would not want to hold you away from an investment <laughs> meeting but I'm, i imagine you've posted your details so we can get in touch um on the chat um we normally have a bit of an after party after these events so if anyone wants to linger beyond two o'clock you're more than welcome to do so. But um, Mickey, thanks again very much for that. That was that was great. I think the the whole we'll we'll all be looking those up now and, and buying our crypto. <laughs> Yay! Nice to meet you then, guys. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Mickey. Um, great. Thank you all so much. It's on the hour. If you've got to go, then please do. Uh, please make please come on the third of March. It's like this, but we we have one to ones uh, at random. You never know who you're going to meet. Um, we've had junior graphic designers meeting artistic directors um, for five minutes in the past, and it can't work any other way. So thank you all very much. We're going to linger um, if you want to do a little bit of open networking from, from now. Um, Zemina, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Gabs. Hey, thank you, Mark. I do need to shoot, but I'll see you at quarter past four. Yes, see you later. <laughs> OK. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Lovely to meet everybody. Thanks, Bye. Greta. Thank you. Bye. Bye.